Hello? Good? I'd uh, like to welcome you all to Case Western Reserve University. Uh, my name is Patricia Prince House, and uh, this event has sort of evolved on its own. It was originally going to be a debate, but uh, that hasn't worked out, so we are very happy to present a talk by Ken Miller uh, entitled The Collapse of Intelligent Design. Will the next monkey trial be in Ohio? And uh, before we get underway here, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Reverend George Murphy. Uh, if you could come up, uh, he's just going to uh, uh, give us a little uh, blessing here. Do Dr. Murphy has a PhD in physics and is also a Lutheran minister, and he's a uh, pastoral associate at uh, uh, St. Paul's in Akron. Let us pray. To God, we're gathered here to consider some very important issues about life, about our society, about your role in the world. We pray that we would be guided to have your wisdom and your insight so that we can consider these issues with humility, but also with the knowledge that you want us to seek the truth. Amen. Thank you. I, I guess I'm next. Um, uh, I want to uh, um, thank uh, Patricia for inviting me here. I want to thank especially Reverend Murphy for that, that wonderful prayer, um, which I was very pleased to join in. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, we live in interesting times, which will be a repeated theme of what I will talk about tonight. Um, I figured I, uh, many of you in the audience are people who know me or have heard me speak before. It's nice to see you again. For those of you who don't know me, I thought I would introduce myself. Um, I'm a cell biologist. I work at Brown University, which is in, in Providence, Rhode Island. I work on the structure and function of biological membranes. Uh, a lot of my work is with the electron microscope, and we try to work on uh, uh, assemblies and channels in biological membranes. That's, in a sense, as a researcher, that's one of my jobs. Another of my jobs is that of a teacher. Um, I'm able to be here today because we're between semesters. My spring classes start on January 26th, and in the fall I teach an upper level course in cell and molecular biology. In the spring I teach a freshman biology course, which is the largest single class at my university. How big is the class? That's not my class. Those are my teaching assistants. Um, <laughs> that will give you some idea as to how big the class is. I also see, I'm very happy to see a large number of young people in the room, and I want to let all of you know, all the young people especially, that. You may already know me, and you may not like me. And the reason for that is if when you were in high school, you used any of these books for high school biology, I wrote them. So I apologize in advance for your experiences or for the backbreaking strain of carrying these guys around in your backpack. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book on evolution and religion called Finding Darwin's God, which I expected to be a nice little book that would be tucked away. Um, on library shelves and pretty much forgotten, although I was sure it would make my mother very proud. Uh, to my absolute astonishment, this book is now in its 23rd printing uh, in paperback and has proven, uh, in the words of my editor at Harper, Harper Collins, to be a bit of a classic on the issue. And if you are interested in issues of evolution and religion, I would very humbly suggest that you might find the book interesting. The subtitle is The Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution. Very often, when I go out and talk on this issue, I focus on religious aspects. Um, I'd be very happy to answer questions along those lines, but tonight I'm going to focus on the issue of intelligent design, especially as it relates or might relate to Ohio. As I said in the beginning, we live in interesting times. I think one way to think about that is to go back into what is now ancient history. In 1999, the Board of Education of the state of Kansas deleted all mention of evolution from the state science standards. They did that because they regarded evolution either as shaky science or as threatening to the personal beliefs of students uh, and their parents. Uh, what happened afterwards, I think, is, is remarkable. The voters of Kansas had about a year to think about this. Uh, and in the summer of 2000, they voted most of that board out of office and elected a new pro-science majority to the board. Well, as, as a responsive audience, if you're applauding for that, then you should probably boo for the elections in 2004. 
Um, and what happened that summer was that an anti-science or anti-evolution majority, majority of six to four, gained control of the Kansas board. Um, and uh, in a little bit, I will show you what they have been doing in the past years to science, in the past year to science standards in Kansas. Um, I spent almost a week that summer in Kansas, actually campaigning for pro-science candidates. I actually expect to do that this summer in Kansas and the New York Times when they wrote up this on the front page of the Weekend Review were kind enough to mention me, take a couple quotes from what I talked about, and also mention the title of my book. Um, what happened the next day was remarkable. Whatever you think about people who read the New York Times, they buy books. On Monday morning, a friend of mine called me up and said, have you looked at the bestseller list on Amazon? I said, no, why? He said, just look at it. My book was number 21 on the bestseller list, sandwiched directly between Clancy and Grisham. Uh, it was very exciting. <laughs> It only lasted 11 or 12 hours, but I enjoyed it very much. Um, and of course, for those of you who are interested, I have very helpfully placed the ISBN number up there on the slide. Um, one of the things that I have found in a history of from time to time, not always, but from time to time going around and debating people on the issue of evolution, which is after all what I expected might take place tonight, um, is that debaters on this issue claim to lead a purely scientific movement. And the pictures you see up here are from a debate in which I participated uh, about three years ago in Columbus in front of the Ohio Board of Education. And the topic at that time was whether intelligent design should be included in the curriculum of Ohio public schools. Now, one of the things that's striking about this is this purely scientific movement attracts an awful lot of support, which is not necessarily scientific. And I want to show you a picture that was taken outside the auditorium in Columbus on the way in. And this gentleman here was in the business of telling me and other people exactly where we would spend eternity if we were foolish enough to take the side of Charles Darwin. It's very clear that this is an issue that arouses very strong and very strongly felt religious feelings. And you might ask yourself, you know, why is that? Um, why, for example, is evolution under attack? Biology is a field that has many disciplines. And if you're going to take one thing out of the biology curriculum, why would you take out evolution? What's special about that? I mean, why not take out cell biology or physiology or, for God's sakes, why not organic chemistry? Um, um, I can see we have the makings of a popular movement. And I apologize in advance for any chemists who might be in the audience. Um, it's a cheap shot. I realize that. Um, but what's the reason? The reason opponents of evolution will often say is because evolution is very shaky science and we want to get the science right. But if you go to a website such as Answers in Genesis, which is the leading anti-evolution organization in the United States, you'll find a very different set of reasons. And I invite you to take a look at this graphic. Evolution is depicted as the foundation of lawlessness, homosexuality, pornography, and abortion. Not just that it's wrong, but it is the source of all of these bad things, whereas creationism is the source of a lot of good things. Now, if this is not graphic enough for you, I've got another one that I think will help. And this is also from Answers in Genesis. And I show this not because I want to make fun of it, but because I want to make a deadly serious point. And I like to show this to academic audiences because academic audiences often think this really is an argue about sci argument about science. And they say, how about if we did this experiment? How about if we showed them this fossil? How about if we did this in the laboratory? Would that convince them? Well, take a look at this. If you regard evolution as the foundation of divorce, pornography, abortion, racism, and all this other bad stuff, whether it's right or not in the scientific sense doesn't matter because it is the source of everything that is wrong and evil in society. And what I love about this is the founder of evolution, I can't read that name here, I'm sure you can, but it's not Darwin, um, it's somebody else. And if you portray, if you view evolution in this respect, of course you're going to oppose it, you're going to oppose it deeply. So how do you answer? How does science respond? I think there are a lot of ways to respond, and one way is to develop a proper understanding of science. Some of you may know that about four years ago, a county in Georgia thought that the new biology books they had bought for their students were so dangerous in terms of their treatment of evolution that they needed warning stickers on them. And I thought you might be interested. What textbook 
was so dangerous and so outrageous that it needed a warning sticker. So I figured I'd bring you a picture. There it is. That's the book. And this is the warning sticker. And the warning sticker basically told students the book has material on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, on the origin of living things. This material should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully and critically considered. And when this sticker went on the book, I was called up by a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And she said, what do you think of the sticker on your books? And I had talked to enough reporters to realize that she was trolling for a quote. She wanted to write an article that said, author outraged, or author slams bored, or just something like that, so they could say that a Northeastern liberal Ivy League author was outraged at what Cobb County was doing with his books. And I decided I have a little fun, and I said, no, oh, I like the sticker. She said, you do? I, think, I said, I think the stickers are great. They just don't go far enough. And in just a second, I'll show you exactly what I mean. Now, as it turns out, our president has tried to be helpful on this particular point. And many of you may know that President Bush was asked about this, and he said, I think students should be exposed to both sides of the issue, by which he meant evolution and also intelligent design. Um, and Time Magazine, when they wrote this up, absolutely incredibly, my co-author Joe Levine found this, they superimposed President Bush's face on our biology textbook, which has caused us absolutely no end of delight. Um, and I keep suggesting to the publisher, you know, maybe in the next edition, um, that's what we could use. <laughs> but I have been asked about what I think about President Bush's opinion on this issue. And I, I think my response probably should be that I, like all other scientists and educators, are delighted that the president has taken an issue, an interest in science education. We, keep, we hope he continues to be interested in it. And we also hope very much that President Bush will listen to his science advisor, John Marburger, who's a fine scientist um, and was picked by President Bush to give him advice on science. Um, he was asked by Russell Durbin from Ohio State University what he thought about evolution. And Dr. Marburger said evolution is the cornerstone of modern biology. And he pointed out an awful lot of work that we do at NIH depends upon evolution. And then he was very quick to say that President Bush has supported large increases for NIH funding. Um, and he was also asked, at the National Association of Science Writers, he said, look, intelligent design is not a scientific theory. And as if to ram the point home, he continued, I don't regard intelligent design as a scientific topic. And again, I think if the president listens to his science advisor, he'll be in very good shape. What about, what about those warning stickers, the ones that I liked uh, so much? Uh, one of my former students, Colin Purrington, who's now at Swarthmore College, was so taken by this wonderful idea of warning stickers that Colin figured, you know, why stop with biology books? We could go a little bit further than that. Um, here, for example, is one that we might use on an earth science book, uh, pointing out that a lot of people think that the earth couldn't possibly be four billion years old. You ought to be careful about that. Um, and why stop with earth science? Um, we could go on to geography, <laughs> the earth is round. And then finally, my favorite, because I've always been suspicious of physics. Uh, with all due respect to Dr. Krauss, who's in the audience tonight, you physicists have some very strange ideas. Um, for example, a physics textbook's material on gravity. It's worth pointing out that gravity is a theory, not a fact, regarding a force that no one has ever seen. Think about that when you think about the approach, the approach of gravity. Um, but what happened in Georgia was that a group of six parents recognized that these stickers were, in fact, an attempt to promote a particular religious point of view. And they filed a lawsuit in federal court. The lead plaintiff was a guy named Jeff Selman. Jeff is the little guy here uh, being lectured by a Board of Education member in this picture. Uh, Jeff was able to prevail in federal court. And the court basically asked that these stickers ordered that these stickers be taken out. This is Jeff and his attorney very happy afterwards. Because I had testified in the trial, the Associated Press asked me for comments afterwards. And like a fool, I answered my phone and I gave them some comments. And as a result, my name was in the first sentence of the story on this that appeared in about 1,100 newspapers. The next morning, I got more you're going to burn in hell email than you can possibly imagine from all over the country. But I have to say that it was far outweighed by a lot of congratulatory email as well. So let me get back to this case and to the sticker in particular. Um, I said I like this sticker. And I do, in a sense. It just doesn't go far enough. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, yes, the book does have material on evolution, but a biology book has material on a lot of topics. Why single out evolution? Evolution is a theory. It certainly is. 
We actually have a chapter entitled Evolutionary Theory, so I agree it's a theory. But when you say it's a theory, not a fact, it makes it sound like theories and facts are opposite things, as if we're really sure of facts and we're not so sure of theories. In fact, theory in science is a higher level of understanding than facts, because what theories do is they explain facts, they unite them. And I pointed out to this reporter, if you went to the University of Georgia and you studied atomic physics, you would take a course in atomic theory. There's no time in the future when the professor is going to change the name of that course to atomic fact, because that's not what atomic theory is about. Atomic theory is a system of explanations that explains thousands, tens of thousands of facts about the nature of matter. And that's what evolutionary theory is like, too. But when you get right down to it, the sentence that bothered me the most is actually the third one. And the reporter said, what do you mean? You don't like open-mindedness or critical? I said, no, that's not it at all. Do you know what that third sentence says to a 14-year-old? That third sentence says, we are certain of every single thing in this book except evolution. So apparently, you don't need an open mind to study biochemistry. We don't have to critically consider ecology or cell biology or human physiology. And in reality, if I got a chance to rewrite the sticker, I'd rewrite it like this. This textbook has material on science. Science is built around theories which are strongly supported by factual evidence. Everything in science should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. That's the appropriate emphasis, and that's the sticker that I'd like to see. <laughs> Bottom line, singling out evolution or any subject for special treatment is very bad science education and also is legally dangerous. And the reason it's legally dangerous is because it naturally leads one to say, why? Why are you singling out one topic for special consideration? And if that reason turns out to be constitutionally prohibited, you might be in difficult straits. We'll talk more about that in a second. Now, you all know this didn't end down in Georgia. Uh, the next migration of this controversy was to Dover, Pennsylvania, where the Board of Education, a little more than a year ago, decided that they would like to teach something called intelligent design. They ordered their biology teachers to prepare an intelligent design curriculum. The teachers refused, and they cited a provision of the Pennsylvania Teacher Code of Ethics in which the teachers had to promise in that state that they would never knowingly present false information to a student. And they told their superintendent, this is false information. We can't violate our oaths. What the board then did was to order its superintendent and assistant superintendent to go into classes and to read a one-minute statement about intelligent design to students. That led a number of parents to complain about this, and before long there was a federal lawsuit. That lawsuit was tried this fall from September to late October. Uh, there were a number of people on both sides of the issue. This is Robert Pennock, who's a philosopher of science from Michigan State, um, and I uh, was honored by being the lead witness for the plaintiffs in the case. I spent about a day and a half on the stand. I had a very good time. Um, then, as you all know, the trial eventually was decided. Now, there's a couple of funny things I have to tell you about this. Um, I didn't expect my cross-examination to go on for two days, um, and I expected to be back at Brown on Tuesday to teach a class. When I realized I couldn't, I had to do something I've never done in 26 years of college teaching, and that was to cancel a lecture class. So I got in touch with my TAs, and I said, I've got to cancel a class on Tuesday. Here's why. I said, okay. Um, and then I put a link to the article in Science about the trial on my course's website, so you know, the students would know I was not off you know, skiing or something like that. Um, and they thought that was okay. Then I put a link into the New York Times, and I guess they thought that okay. But they weren't, I weren't particularly impressed. What impressed the, the kids in my class was that week, there was a report on the trial in what is for college students in the United States, the ultimate news source. And I'm sure all the college students in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and that was... <laughs> The Daily Show by John Stewart, and when John Stewart talked about the trial in Dover, that was the point at which the students I decided I was really doing something useful. Because if the Daily Show is talking about it, then it's, it's happening. Um, I'm sure many of you may know that the Dover voters, in one sense or another, uh, took care of this themselves. Uh, democracy works. Um, and before the court case was decided, before the court case was decided, they voted the entire Board of Education. Uh, all eight members up for re-election were voted out of office. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a marvelous testament to the fact that uh, people can understand the issues 
And when they understand the issues, they go out and they make intelligent choices. And I should also point out that this was actually, in many respects, was difficult for voters in Dover to do. This is a town that typically votes 75 percent Republican. The school board was all Republican. Almost all of the insurgent candidates were registered Republicans. To be sure they got in the ballot in November, they had to switch parties to the Democratic side so they could file as a single slate. And then they had to convince people, yes, we know that you're Republican. We are Republican. We are conservatives, too. But we want you to go to the Democratic side and pull the lever for us. And lo and behold, they did. So it was remarkable stuff. Um, while this was going on, the legal system worked as well. Um, and at the end of the trial, uh, the federal judge who uh, rendered this verdict, uh, John Jones, uh, basically ruled that intelligent design was unconstitutional. His verdict was sweeping. And that is he not only uh, ruled on the narrow issue of whether this was appropriate, he ruled on the broader issue of whether intelligent design was actually a legitimate scientific idea that belonged in the classroom at all. Um, these are some pictures that were taken from the ruling. These are some of the winning plaintiffs. The case has the name Kitz Miller et al., based on Tammy Kitz Miller here, who was the first lead plaintiff. And I would invite any of you who are interested in this decision to read it. It's very readable. In fact, parts of it, as I will show you, are very funny. Um, and if you just do Kitz, K-I-T-Z Miller, on Google, you will find it right away on the web, and it's floating around. This is Judge Jones. One of the things I got a kick out of was the insistence uh, by some people who didn't like the verdict the Judge Jones was another one of those darn liberal activist judges. Um, this is a cartoon talking about this exact point. Um, I'll blow this up a little bit. Um, and this is the sort of thing we have to appoint more church-going Republican judges. And this person who presumably knows Judge Jones says, uh, by the way, he is a Bush-appointed church-going Republican judge. Uh, judge, uh, judge Jones is a political protege of former Governor Tom Ridge of the state of Pennsylvania. And Judge Jones was recommended for the federal bench by Senator Rick Santorum in Pennsylvania. So any notion, any notion that Judge Jones is a liberal activist judge is belied by who his sponsors were and also by his judicial record. He simply, I am convinced, someone who is bright, who is intelligent, and who understands the meaning of the Constitution. And just like a good umpire who calls him like he sees him. Um, and that's exactly what happened in this case. Um, this is a nationwide issue. I've talked about trials in Georgia and Pennsylvania. I'm sure all of you are familiar that this has been an issue in the state of Ohio. It is also a continuing issue, as we shall see, in the state of Kansas. And I just very quickly colored in a few more states in which there are either boards of education that are trying to de-emphasize evolution or bills filed in state legislature to give equal time to intelligent design theory, criticisms of evolution, or even creation science. Many of my friends up in the Northeast tend to say, oh, this is just a problem in flyover country. Who cares about this? I actually spoke at Harvard a couple of months ago. You aren't going to believe this. And somebody put their hand up and said, who cares what they teach kids in Alabama and Mississippi? Um, and I thought, wow, um, you know, realize how that sounds. Um, and then I realized I was at Harvard. And I pointed out that E.O. Wilson, the great evolutionary biologist at Harvard, grew up in Alabama. And the point is, does it matter what we teach kids in Alabama and Mississippi? For all we know, the next Stephen Jay Gould or E.O. Wilson is down there in Alabama and Mississippi, and you damn straight, it matters what we teach people in every classroom in this country. Let's go to Kansas. Advocates of so-called intelligent design scored, no question about it, a major victory in Kansas this year by attacking what they called naturalism in state standards. This may happen in Ohio, too, so I would urge you to be on guard about this. Now, what do I mean by naturalism? The Board of Education in Kansas, which is now governed by a six to four anti-evolution majority, held a series of hearings to which many scientists, including myself, were invited and to which we did not go. And the reason for that was because the three board members who presided over the hearings had already announced in advance that they were against evolution. And the hearings were, in our opinion, simply a political sham. Well, what happened afterwards is the board decided, first of all, that they would de-emphasize evolution. Secondly, that they would introduce so-called criticisms of evolution of the sort that you've seen in Ohio. But if you really want to know what is at risk from the anti-evolution movement, look at Kansas. And the reason for that is when the anti-evolution movement got control of the State Board of Education, what did they do? They rewrote 
the definition of science itself. Not just biology, not just evolution. Science, all of a sudden, they're getting the chemists upset. They're getting the physicists upset. They're even getting the geologists, who paid no attention to anybody, upset <laughs> on this issue. Now, what do I mean by rewriting the definition of science? This was the definition of science in the Candace School Standards. Science is the human activity of seeking natural explanations for what we observe in the world around us. It seems to me like a straightforward, common sense, easy to understand definition of science. Did the new board like that? Uh-uh. They deleted that. And they decided, we want to put this up. Science is a method of systematic uh, continuing investigation, uses all this good stuff, to lead to more adequate explanations of natural phenomena. That doesn't sound too bad. But wait a minute, what do they mean by more adequate as opposed to natural explanations? Remember the standards what said, once said, we seek natural explanations from science, and they now say we want more adequate explanations. Well, the board majority explained this to everybody, and they said, here's, the, here's what we want to do. We want to get rid of the concept of methodological naturalism that is used in physics and chemistry. Um, and basically, we think that what naturalism does is it limits inquiry and permissible explanations and promotes the philosophy of naturalism. In short, we want to open science up to non-naturalistic explanations. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. What is a non-naturalistic explanation? I can't think of anything except the supernatural explanation. Supernatural explanations may be correct. Remember, I live in New England. A lot of people who looked at the baseball playoffs in 2004 could, could see the hand of God in the success of the Red Sox. And you know what? I, I think that might be true. I think God might have had his fill of George Steinbrenner that year, um, and that was it. But that explanation, even if correct, is not science because it's not testable. And that's the point that is made. And the notion of promoting non-naturalistic explanations is exactly what's happened in Kansas. Now, you might say, but, you know, come on, shouldn't you teach both sides? Well, sure you should. But you have to realize that with many scientific ideas, when you talk about teaching both sides, what are we talking about when we talk about both sides of chemistry, neurobiology, physics, or astronomy? When you look at the other side, you might be disturbed as to what the other side is. It could be alchemy, phrenology, outright magic, or astrology. Now, this is, I, I think most of you will agree, even if you don't like what I'm saying right now, most of you will agree, that's a pretty funny cartoon. But it's, you know, it's an editorial, I mean, come on. This is an editorial cartoonist. He's taking license with the facts. Nobody really wants these things in the science classroom. And you know what? Until the Dover trial, I would have thought that too. But a funny thing happened at the Dover trial. Pay attention to this one down here. Um, and that is, where would intelligent design take the science classrooms? Michael Behe was placed on the stand under oath in the Dover trial. Michael is a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University. He's probably the country's leading advocate of what he calls the biochemical challenge to evolution. He is very much in favor of intelligent design. He's a member of the Discovery Institute. He's been here in Ohio. On cross-examination, Dr. Behe admitted that his definition of theory was so broad, it would also include astrology. Um, and here's another thing from the same article. Um, he also pointed out, the lawyer pointed out, that astrology would come under this definition. Behe agreed with that, and the exchange prompted laughter from the court. Now, I wasn't in the courtroom that day, but I'm sure it was pretty funny to see an advocate for intelligent design say yes, if you stretch the definition of science to include intelligent design, you know what else fits in that strike zone? Astrology. And I would add, so does mysticism, pyramid power, new age spiritualism, and Wiccan teaching or witchcraft. Now, I'm sure this is all really fine stuff, but one of the things that it's not is science, and that's the point. And I think the relevant question that anyone who advocates intelligent design has to answer is you want to open the science classroom up to intelligent design. You will also open it to astrology and a whole host of pseudoscientific beliefs. Is this really what you want to do in, there, in terms of in, uh, reforming science teaching? And I should point out, this was not an accidental statement by Dr. B. He, he said it in his deposition. Then he said it in trial. The attorney asked him again, are you sure? Do you really mean that? And he went on and he said yes, and he thought astrology had made some very fundamental contributions to science. So in any event, 
Um, that's where we are with this. Now, one of the questions that I wanted to ask for, uh, in front of this audience tonight is whether or not we can learn anything from the Dover trial. Um, I, I've only been in two trials in my life. Actually, I guess I've been in three because I served in a jury for another trial. But it's really different being on the witness stand and being cross-examined and seeing all these people there. And I have to say it was a very exhilarating experience. It was uh, not unlike a graduate seminar when you're surrounded by really sharp grad students who are going to push you up against the wall and see if you really know the stuff. So what I want to tell you basically in a sense is what I learned at the trial and I think what most of it can take away from. It. Here's the first thing that I saw at the trial. It was the reason for the title of my talk tonight. What we saw was the literal collapse of intelligent design as a scientific theory. Now let me try to explain to you what I mean by that. One of the first things that intelligent design argues is that it is necessary to explain what we see in the fossil record. That the fossil record is a problem of one sort for evolution. You might hear people say that the fossil record doesn't support evolution. Well, the National Academy of Sciences only a few years ago basically said, look, there are so many intermediate forms between all these species that it's often difficult to identify categorically where the transition occurs from one species to another. In other words, there's so many transitional forms, we actually argue about this. Christine Janis, a friend of mine at Brown, who's a paleontologist, um, I once asked Christine, you know, what about this uh, business of no transitional forms? And she said, are you kidding? I just came back from a meeting where there were 11 or 12 new fossils from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming were being introduced, and almost fistfights broke out among the scientists arguing as to whether or not these fossils should be called mammal-like reptiles or reptile-like mammals. If, people are, if paleontologists are willing to argue about that, it tells you two things. One is paleontologists will argue about anything. And the second thing that it will tell you is that there are innumerable intermediate and transitional forms that we see in the fossil record. But I want to go a little bit further than, than this. Um, one of the arguments that has often been made against evolution is that the fossil record doesn't have the intermediates that it ought to. For example, we've known for a long time that whales and dolphins evolved from terrestrial mammals. There are unmistakable marks in their genetics and in their skeleton of this. But critics of evolution have said, oh yeah? Well, you know, if they did, where are the intermediate forms? You know, put up or shut up. And in fact, I've even seen cartoons that looked a bit like this, ridiculing the notion that an intermediate could even exist between a land mammal and a swimming mammal, and the argument is that such animals would be so awkward on the land and so poor at swimming in the water that they really wouldn't be survivable. Well, the cartoons and the arguments started to disappear about 10 or 12 years ago when the very first skeletons of exactly such creatures were dug up. This is the skeleton of an organism which is now called Ambulocetus natans. And if your Latin is good, you'll know that Ambulocetus means the walking whale and natons means who swims. This is the walking whale who swims. It is a perfect intermediate form to plug right in the middle. So you might say, do we now have a true intermediate form? Not really. As it turns out, we have five intermediate forms that fill this gap, all discovered within the last two decades, precisely because paleontologists, when they found this guy, they figured out we know where to look. And where to look is in the Indus River Valley between India and Pakistan. That's where these creatures evolved, and that's where more intermediate fossils are found all the time. Okay, so do evolutionists say, yay, we've solved the problem, evolution is true, Darwin was right? No. Science is enormously self-critical. If this really happened, if this is a genuine evolutionary series, do you know what has to have happened along with it? The middle ear has to have been completely changed. And the reason for that is the middle ear that a land mammal, like us, has is very good for hearing in the air. If any of you have scuba dived or snorkeled, you know that your hearing stinks underwater. Hearing is lousy. But the underwater hearing of these guys is sensational. It's so good they can use it as a form of sonar. That's because their middle ear structure is entirely different. So if this is real, we should be able to look at the middle ear structure of these fossils and see intermediate forms in which they're reshaped. And you know what? That's exactly what we see. This is a paper a year and a half ago from Nature dissecting a series of fossil skulls and showing exactly how the apparatus in the middle ear was remodeled through a whole series of intermediate forms to change from an apparatus that was good for hearing in the air to an apparatus that was intermediate to an apparatus that was terrific for hearing under the water. 
So the fossil record, the more we fill it in, the more complete it becomes and the more powerful it becomes as evidence for evolution. The second thing that you saw at the trial was that when data was introduced at the trial, which I and another witness introduced from whole genome sequencing, the intelligent design advocates just literally had nothing to say. We weren't asked questions in cross-examination. The other side never brought it up. They never argued against it. They just left it. Here's an example. Um, many of you may know that a few months ago, the genetic code of the chimpanzee was published. Therefore, we can compare our genome to these primate relatives. What do we find? I want to show you one striking finding that dates to about a year ago. You all know that evolution argues that we share a common ancestor with the great apes, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. Well, if that's true, there should be genetic similarities, and in fact, there are. But there's something that's really interesting and has the potential, if it were true, to contradict evolutionary common ancestry. And that is, we have two fewer chromosomes than the other great apes. We have 46, they all have 48. That's very interesting. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, um, the 46 chromosomes that we have, you got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. So it's actually 23 pairs. These guys have 24 from each parent, so they have 24 pairs. So everybody in this room is missing a pair of chromosomes. Now, where did it go? Could it have gotten lost in our lineage? Uh-uh. If it got lost, if a whole primate chromosome was lost, that would be lethal. So there's only two possibilities. And that is, if these guys really share a common ancestor, that ancestor either had 48 chromosomes or 46. Now, if it had 48, 24 pairs, which is probably true, because three out of four have 48 chromosomes, what must have happened is that one pair of chromosomes must have gotten fused. So we should be able to look at our genome and discover that one of our chromosomes resulted from the fusion of two primate chromosomes. So we should be able to look around our genome. And you know what? If we don't find it, evolution is wrong. We don't share a common ancestor. So if, how would we find it? Well, biologists in the room will know that chromosomes have nifty little markers. They have markers called centromeres, which are DNA sequences that are used to separate them during mitosis, and they have cool little DNA sequences on the end called telomeres. What would happen if a pair of chromosomes got fused? Well, what would happen is the fusion would put telomeres where they don't belong in the center of the chromosome, and the resulting fused chromosome should actually have two centromeres. One of them might become inactivated, but nonetheless, it should still be there. So we can scan our genome, and you know what? If we don't find that chromosome, evolution's in trouble. Well, guess what? It's chromosome number two. Our chromosome number two was formed by the fusion of two primate chromosomes. Uh, this is the paper from Nature a little more than a year ago. And I put up a little of the paper. I'm sorry it's technical, but look at what it says. Chromosome two is unique to our lineage. It emerged as a result of the head-to-head -head fusion of two chromosomes that remain separate in other primates. Those of you who have not kept up with how much we know about the genome uh, should pay attention to this, because you'll be amazed at how precisely we can look at things. The precise fusion site has been located at base number 114,455,823 to 114,455,838. In other words, within 15 bases. And you'll notice multiple subtelomeric duplications the telomeres that don't belong, and lo and behold, um, the centromere that is inactivated corresponds to chimp chromosome 13. It's there, it's testable, it confirms the prediction of evolution. How would intelligent design explain this? Only one way, by shrugging and saying, that's the way the designer made it. No reason, no rhyme, presumably there's a designer who designed human chromosome number two to make it look as if it was formed by the fusion from a private ancestor. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a theist. In, in the broadest sense, I would say I believe in a designer. But you know what? I don't believe in a deceptive one. I don't believe in one who would do this to try to fool us. And therefore, I think this is authentic. And it tells us something about our ancestry. Third thing that was abundantly clear at the trial, these great icons of intelligent design, the things that are supposedly unevolvable, they've fallen apart. Example, specifically taken apart at the trial, the notion that the bacterial flagellum couldn't have been produced by evolution, or the blood clotting cascade, or the generation of biological information. I don't have time to talk about all three, but I'm going to show you two of them. Um, the notion that these complicated biochemical structures 
couldn't have been produced by evolution. It's been championed by Michael Behe. And Behe has an idea that he calls irreducible complexity. And he says, you can't evolve these things because they're irreducibly complex. Notice what he says. An irreducibly complex system can't be produced the way that evolution works by numerous successive slight modifications of a precursor system because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. These are multi-part systems. And he's basically telling you that the 30 or 40 proteins that are in here, they all have to be together or there's no function. And since natural selection does have to work gradually, I agree on that point, um, it can't produce 20, 25, 26 proteins knowing what will eventually happen because natural selection is blind, which is indeed absolutely true. So the poster child for intelligent design by any standard, it shows up so often, it really could be called the poster child, is in fact the bacterial flagellum. This was mentioned so often in the trial that the judge, uh, probably from t fatigue, got a little sarcastic about it. One of the attorneys said, Your Honor, when we reconvene, we're going to talk again about the bacterial flagellum. And the judge at one point said, Oh, goody. Um, <laughs> the last expert witness for the Board of Education, a biochemist named Scott Minnick from the University of Idaho, was called up to the stands to talk about this. And since Behe had talked about it, and the lawyers had talked about it, and they had argued about it, and I had talked about it, as I'm going to show you here for a second, Minich got up there, and he said he was going to talk about the bacterial flagellum, and the judge, uh, the judge deadpanned, well, we've heard that before, and Minnick turned to him, this is the best line of the trial, Minnick turned to him and said, you know, Your Honor, I sort of feel like Zsa, Zsa Gabor's fifth husband. I know what to do, I just don't know how to make it exciting. Um, and uh, so I, I take my hat off to Scott. That was good. I like that. Um, so what, what is this argument about? Here, here's the argument in very simplified form. Um, if you have a complex, multi-part biochemical machine composed of many parts, its function, everyone agrees, can be favored by natural selection. But the argument is that evolution can't produce them because the individual parts have no function of their own. That's what irreducible complexity means. So natural selection can't make this, doesn't have any function. Can't make that, can't make that. Um, therefore, you can't evolve a structure like this. Now, how does evolution explain something like that? Well, ever since Darwin, we've had a very good explanation. Um, and that is these complicated machines, they don't arise from scratch. They arise from combinations of components that have different functions, functions of their own. And the components originate with functions of their own as well. Therefore, natural selection will work every step of the way. Now, that's not evidence. That's just an argument. But the beauty of this is we can now hold these two ideas up against each other. And we can say, who's right? If irreducible complexity is right, then the parts of these machines should be absolutely useless. But if evolution is right, we should be able to take these machines, look at their parts, and discover, wow, they do other jobs. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's take the bacterial flagellum. So if we start with the flagellum, here it is. And these drawings name the genes and the proteins in the flagellum. And we say, let's take away a whole bunch of the parts. How many? Um, not one, not five, not ten. Let's take 40 of its 50 parts away. Now watch very carefully, because I'm going to do that experiment right there. There it goes. The parts are all gone. And I have left ten parts that span the membrane. What are left behind are ten proteins in the base of the flagellum. Now, if irreducible complexity is right, this should be absolutely functionless. It should have no function. But if you'll pardon the double negative, what is left behind is not non-functional. What is left behind is the type 3 secretory system, and it is fully functional. I know most of you in the room are going, of course, the type 3 secretory system. <laughs> the type 3 secretory system is a molecular syringe in which some of the nastiest protein uh, 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 bacteria on this planet produce toxic proteins, grab onto one of our cells, and inject those proteins into our cells. The bacterium that causes bubonic plague works this way. It's really nasty stuff. Well, guess what? The 10 proteins that make up the type 3 secretory system are directly homologous to the 10 proteins in the base of the bacterial flagellum. They don't produce movement. They're not a flagellum. But are they functional? They are fully functional. So remember that claim. Any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. This guy is missing 40 parts 
and it is perfectly functional. What that means, there's no other word for it, is that that statement is wrong. Now, that's not an incidental statement. That is the heart and soul of the intelligent design argument. And in this case, it turns out to be wrong. Now, it's even wronger than that, because it turns out that not only do these proteins make up the type 3 secretory apparatus, but almost every protein in the bacterial flagellum is strongly homologous to proteins that have other functions elsewhere in the cell. And what that means is when we look at this wonderful icon of intelligent design, a careful analysis of the flagellum actually matches evolutionary theory, namely the parts should have functions of their own and not the intelligent design prediction. And that's simply a fact. Now, intelligent design does no better when it talks about blood clotting. Um, I'm sure you all know that blood can clot. And many of you who have had the misfortune to take biochemistry as a college course also know that there is a complicated pathway of proteins that is responsible for blood clotting. Dr. Behe argues, and intelligent design argues, that pathway is irreducibly complex. And again, what does he mean? None of these proteins do anything except clot. In the absence of any of them, blood does not clot and the system fails. So the argument is the reason we know a creator had to create it or design it is because all the parts have to be present together. And the reason we know that is in the absence of any of the components, blood doesn't clot and the system fails. Now, this is an argument made by Michael Behe, but it's also an argument that the Dover Board of Education wanted to present to their students. They got a copy, they got 60 copies, two classroom sets of this intelligent design textbook, Pandas and People. Pandas and People makes the exact same claim. Only when all the components are present does the system function properly, even though, uh, and us nasty evolutionary biologists point out, that all of these proteins, are almost all of them are serine proteases, which means they were probably formed by successive rounds of gene duplication. But once again, they say all the proteins, no, nothing, unequ nothing equivocal here, all the proteins have to be present simultaneously for the clotting system to function. That's very interesting. Being an empirical scientist, I always want to say, is that right? Well, how could we test it? We could test it by taking this wonderfully complicated system and let's take a component away. Let's knock one out and see if they're right. Well, the first one that we can knock out, because nature's done the experiment for us, is factor 12. Um, what happens if we knock out factor 12? Another PowerPoint experiment, there it goes. Factor 12 is gone. Will blood still clot? Well, not in us, but it turns out that whales and dolphins lack factor 12. It's actually an evolutionary adaptation to deep sea diving, and their blood clots just fine. That means that proposition that they all have to be present is wrong. Now, taking one away, that's kind of chintzy. Take, take a few more than one away. OK, fair enough. Um, how about we take three of these factors away? Well, it turns out the puffer fish, a genome that was sequenced just a couple years ago, is missing the entire three-part contact phase system up there. The puffer fish has blood that clots just fine. So this argument about unevolvability, which is based basically on the argument that all the parts have to be present, it just turns out to be wrong. It falls apart. And this is something else that showed up in the trial. Um, this is technical information, but it basically shows that Doolittle has worked out an evolutionary scheme for how all the factors evolved from a single set of components that existed before blood clotting was evolved, and that leads to an evolutionary prediction. And the evolutionary prediction is shown over here and over here in another paper. And that is that the protein should have very specific relationships to each other, the different factors. And lo and behold, you can search the genomes of a host of organisms, and it does exactly that. The relationships match. So what this means with respect to blood clotting is claims that you need every component to be present for biological function, that's the claim. Those claims are false. The second thing is a testable pathway has been proposed. I showed it on the previous slide. Careful analysis of that pathway shows it fits the evolutionary prediction. And there is absolutely no scientific support at all for any suggestion that the pathway was produced in a single step of creation or design. And that's what I mean by the collapse of intelligent design as a scientific theory. Now, the one thing that I haven't shown you because here I'm just going to read you part of the judge's decision, was a similar demonstration on the evolution of the immune system. And Behe has written, and it's part of in Pandas, that Darwinian 
explanations of the evolution of the, the immune system are hopeless and doomed to failure. Well, he wrote that about 10 years ago. And it turns out, as I described in my testimony, a flurry of research has shown exactly how the gene shuffling system in the immune system did evolve. And the judge captured this perfectly in terms of what happened on trial. On cross-examination, Professor B. High was questioned about this claim that science would never find an evolutionary explanation for the immune system. He was presented with 58 peer-reviewed publications, nine books, and several immunology textbook chapters about the evolution of the immune system. However, he ignored all this and simply insisted that it still wasn't sufficient evidence of evolution and that it was simply not good enough. And the, 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 if you want theater in the courtroom, what the lawyer did was held up the first paper, have you read it? He said, no, this is a paper on the evolution of the immune system. Here's the second paper, have you read that? Yeah, I read that one, uh, so forth and so on. And gradually, all 56 papers were piled up in front of the witnesses, a witness all nine books and all of these textbooks, and he simply said, it's evidence that is not good enough for me. I think that made a very strong impression on the judge that here was someone who, regardless of scientific credentials, was determined to ignore the empirical evidence rather than to go by it. The fourth thing that really happened on the trial was that evolution was exposed as a religious doctrine masquerading as science. And I bring this up because I think it is particularly relevant to Ohio. And many of you may think, wait a minute, this doesn't mention uh, religion. It's not really that way. But I want to bring all of you, uh, uh, bring to your attention the federal court test for uh, 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 the actions of a government that might or might not infringe on the First Amendment to the Constitution, the Establishment Clause. And the established precedent is something known as the Lemon Test. And it's a court case of Lemon versus somebody else. And it basically says whatever the government body does, the action has to have a legitimate secular purpose. It can't have the primary effect of either advancing or inhibiting religion. And then finally, even if it, even if it, all oh, this is okay, it still must not result in the excessive entanglement of government and religion. So what the judge did was to apply the lemon test. This is the strictest test. This is the most lenient test. And it turns out he found that the actions of the Dover board failed all three prongs of the lemon test. They showed, for example, that there was no legitimate secular purpose in promoting the teaching of intelligent design. And, and why is this the case? Well, one of the things you might ask is, you know, if intelligent design is a religious idea, so what? What's wrong with introducing it in the science classroom? And this is part of the judge's decision that I think really bears, uh, uh, bears making note of. Introducing this as an idea into a science classroom, as he points out, it sets up what will be perceived by students as a God-friendly science, and that's intelligent design, one that explicitly mentions an intelligent designer, and the other science, evolution, that has no position. What I told the judge is I thought a false duality would be produced. It would tell students quite explicitly, choose God on the side of intelligent design, or choose science on the side of evolution and reject God. And introducing such religious conflict into the classroom, the judge wrote, is very dangerous because it, it forces students to choose between God and science, not a choice that school should be forcing on them. And the last question that I was asked was related to this, and I pointed out to the court that the Lord has blessed me with two daughters. I brought both of my daughters up in my faith, and I also brought both of them up to love science. And one of them has actually become a biologist. The other one has become a teacher. Alas, a history teacher, but we don't speak of her. Um, <laughs> but the point that I wanted to make to the judge is that when my daughters were being educated, I not only wanted them to understand and, and, and adhere to our faith, but I also wanted them to love and understand science. And if they were ever placed in a classroom where they were told explicitly or implicitly, choose the religious theory on this side or the anti-religious theory on this side, choose between God and science, I as a parent, as a taxpayer, as a citizen, would have been outraged at this false choice between religion and science being foisted upon them. And that, as far as I was concerned, was exactly the problem with the Dover policy in terms of introducing this idea into the science classroom. Now, the Dover board, of course, argued that their statement was not religious. And this is the four-paragraph statement that was read to students. And if you look at it quickly, um, I like to paraphrase this statement by saying, Basically, uh, kids, we've got to teach you evolution because the state says we have to. 
Um, then it says evolution. We're going to teach you that, but it's pretty shaky. Um, and there's a lot of problems and gaps. There is this other really cool theory called intelligent design. You will notice that there is no mention of any problems or any gaps in intelligent design. And by the way, we've got this really good textbook in there. Um, and then keep an open mind. Uh, talk about this with your families. And by the way, we have to give you a test at the end of the semester, and evolution will be on the test. And what that essentially does, and the judge certainly agreed, is to undermine evolution and to undermine it for the purpose of promoting intelligent design. Now, you might say, well, intelligent design is not religious. Um, I think it is. But you know what? You don't have to listen to me. And you don't have to listen to the expert witnesses for our side of the case. As the judge pointed out, you can listen to the expert witnesses on the other side of the case. Because it turns out Dr. Behe said that it is implausible that the designer is a natural entity, so it must be supernatural. Uh, Dr. Minnick said that intelligent design requires the ground rules of science to be broadened broaden so that supernatural forces can be considered. And Professor Stephen Fuller said that the project of ID is to change the ground rules of science to include the supernatural. Once again, don't take it from our side of the case. Take it from the other side of the case. ID is, in fact, inherently religious. Now, what does this have to do with Ohio, you might say? Because after all, we're not teaching intelligent design in Ohio. The lesson plans adopted by the Ohio Board of Education, they don't mention intelligent design. And Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute, and this is a posting that Steve has on a website, um, Stephen Meyer even came in front of the Ohio Board of Education, and he promoted not intelligent design, but a teach the controversy prom uh, promotion. Now, this sounds very good. It sounds very neutral. Uh, it seems to have nothing to do with creationism. So you might ask yourself, what does this have to do with creation? or creationism. Well, look at the whole website. And look where Meyer actually posted this work. He posted it on creationdigest.com. And he clearly intended this as a friendly audience to review the news as to what he thinks is happening in Ohio. This is clearly a backdoor way to sneak this um, into the classroom. Consider, for example, that textbook, Pandas and People, which was purchased for the Dover School District. When you read Pandas and People, it doesn't sound like it is religious at all. Darwin is subject to intelligent design, doesn't give a natural thing. Intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency. It sounds pretty scientific. It turns out this is only the latest version. And Pandas and People existed as an earlier draft. We didn't know this until the lawyers subpoenaed the publisher and asked for copies of the earlier versions of this book. And when we saw these earlier versions, we just about fell over. The earlier versions talk about the creation view. Creation means the various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent creator. And in fact, when you hold these two up next to each other, what you discover is incredible. There is paragraph after paragraph in the early and the later versions of the book that read essentially identical, except a global word processor has changed creator to designer, has changed creation to intelligent design. How do you make an intelligent design textbook? You take a creation textbook and change the word create to the word design. And this was abundantly clear. Now, Barbara Forrest, an expert in the history of this idea, got all of the earlier versions. And what she did was she graphed the numbers, the number of mentions of creationism and the number of mentions intelligent design in the earlier version. And you will notice that something remarkable happened in 1987, which is the mention of creation dropped to almost zero and the mention of intelligent design moved up to take its place. Now, I, I don't know what you conclude about this. We'll get to 1987 in just a second. But my first reaction when I saw all these older versions is, my God, didn't these people learn anything from the Nixon administration? Burn this stuff! <laughs> but it wasn't burned, and it's still around, and we know what's going on. Now, some of you may know what it was that happened in 1987. But for those of you who don't know, this is a timeline showing a, 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 a you might say, a legal history of litigation regarding evolution in various courts. And what happened in 1987 is a Supreme Court decision known as Edwards versus Aguilar that identified creationism as a religious doctrine. Literally within a month of that decision, 
the drafts changed from creation and creationism to intelligent design and designer. Basically, there's no question that this was simply relabeling the old product with new pack packaging to make it palatable. And again, this is something else that came out remarkably so at the trial. And what the judge wrote is the plaintiffs meticulously presented. You had to be there to see this. Several drafts, some of which were completed prior to and after the comport decisions. And three astonishing points emerge. One, definition of creation science is identical to the definition of intelligent design. Cognates of the word creation appeared about 150 times were deliberately and systematically replaced with ID. And the changes occurred right after the Supreme Court said that creation science is religious. So the history of this was very straightforward. Um, the members of the, the judge also wrote, um, and this was an extraordinary thing to hear. I'm going to move my lapel pin down by my microphone so you can hear the audio clip in just a second. The judge says, you know, the citizens of the Dover board uh, of Dover were very poorly served by members of the board who voted for the ID policy. Here are two of them up here, former members of the board, now voted out of office. To me, it's remarkable to hear a federal judge talk this way. It is ironic that several of these individuals who so staunchly and proudly touted their religious convictions in public would time and time again lie to cover their tracks and disguise the real purpose behind the ID policy. I don't know about you, but I didn't know federal judges talked like that. And I found that absolutely astonishing. Now, there is at least one, sorry, there is at least one person who understood what the policy was all about. All of you know who that person is, and he called it exactly right. Here he is. Last month, the people of Dover, Pennsylvania, voted to dismiss school board members who supported the theory of intelligent design. But according to some people, that's not all they voted out. I'd like to say to the good citizens of Dover, uh, if there is a disaster in your area, don't turn to God. You just voted God out of your city. <laughs> Pat got it right. Um, this really is a religious idea. And what's astonishing is to see Robertson saying exactly what this is all about. And once again, I think uh, uh, regardless of what you think of the Reverend Robertson, um, I think he was exactly right from his point of view that this was a religious question. Now, um, the question I think that all of you in Ohio have to consider is, is this critical analysis lesson plan that you now have in Ohio, is this really different from the Dover approach? And I've read opinion columns saying immediately, oh, no, it's got nothing to do with it. It's entirely different. The Dover decision is not precedent. That's true. It's just a district court decision. But all of the information that I have talked about tonight was unearthed at the Dover trial, and it's all available. After all, the Discovery Institute came here and told you, didn't they, that they do not want to teach intelligent design in public schools. That's just not their policy. Yeah? That's Stephen Meyer. He's the guy who said that. Stephen Meyer is the author of a book called How to Get Intelligent Design into Public School Curriculum. So if you hear him saying momentarily, no, we don't want to teach intelligent design in Ohio schools, I think the proper way to understand that is we don't want to teach intelligent design in Ohio schools yet. We'll figure out a way to do that. Um, and the lesson plans, of course, don't have anything to do with creationism or intelligent design, do they? Well, guess what? If you look very closely at those lesson plans, what you will discover is the topics for the five lesson plans. Of those five lesson plans, four of them come directly out of the Pandas and People book, the creationist book that was relabeled as an intelligent design textbook. And the fifth one comes directly from Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box. These are also found in a whole series of other uh, intelligent design textbooks, including Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells. And you might ask yourself, well, are any of these really intelligent design books? Go to the Discovery Institute website, and you will find that these are touted as the source books of intelligent design. And the judge realized that correctly, and he wrote something that I think applies directly to Ohio, and as, as I think worth thinking about. And that is, intelligent design's backers have sought to avoid the scientific scrutiny, which we have now determined that it cannot withstand by advocating that the controversy, but not ID itself, should be taught. And what Judge Jones wrote was this tactic is at best disingenuous and at worst a canard. The goal of the intelligent design movement isn't to encourage critical thought, 
but to foment a revolution which would supplant evolutionary theory with ID. And that is part and parcel of the lesson plans now adopted in the state of Ohio. Um, people might say, well, let's be fair. Um, isn't the scientific community biased against intelligent design? Isn't it prejudiced? Doesn't it suppress it? Um, I think that idea under overlooks how often science deals with novel scientific claims. But what we expect people to do is to do real research to back up those claims, to submit them to peer review, to engage in the give and take of scientific argument, to win a scientific consensus, and eventually, if the evidence is on the side of these ideas, no matter how goofy they sound at first, and no matter how much the scientific community opposes them, they will eventually find their way into classroom and textbook. Now, intelligent design advocates like to say they've got a new scientific idea, too. And you know what? If they wanted to do this, I'd be thrilled. I'd say, see at the cell biology meetings, see at biochemistry, see at the earth science meetings. We'll have fun. We'll argue about this. And I'll show you that you're full of it. But you know what? Maybe you'll do the same thing to me. Maybe you'll come up with the experiments, with the evidence, with the analysis that will show you're right. And if you are right, in 10, 15, 20 years, we won't have to go to the school board and argue. You'll automatically be in classroom and textbook. But their idea of how the scientific process should work is not exactly like this. It is rather like this. And that is they would like a direct injection into classroom and textbook. And they'd like that injection with the aid of the political process, which is exactly why they've concentrated not on research. They don't produce any. Not on peer-reviewed publications and not on winning scientific consensus. What they have concentrated on is public relations and political pressure. You might also ask yourself, how many scientific organizations around the country have criticized these Ohio lesson plans? And a few of them are shown up here, including my own scientific society, the American Society for Cell Biology, um, a society that is resident to many, many Nobel laureates and one of the largest experimental societies in the United States. The source for all of this information, by the way, is a great organization called Americans United for Separation of Church and State. If any of you are interested in their activities, they have a very simple web address, AU, for Americans United, AU.org. Um, these are the organizations lined up against the Ohio lesson plans for fairness, for balance, for equal time. I also have to show you the organizations that have lined up in favor of the lesson plan. Here they are. Um, and you can make your own decision as to whether or not this is a lesson plan in which you, as the people of the state of Ohio, should be proud. What is at stake in this? And quite frankly, this is where I want to close. I think what is at stake literally is everything. Um, this is a cartoon, last panel of a cartoon, that a friend of mine sent me. And you can see there's a young man here. I assume he's a Hindu or Pakistani. He's in a science laboratory studying science. And you can see this as the creationist found unlikely support among students in China and India. And this young man is saying, oh, yes, America, we would like it very much if you would teach your students, your children, religious dogma instead of science. We'd like their jobs. And I think uh, to, to pull absolutely no punches, what is at stake in this argument, in this debate, in this political struggle isn't whether students will learn evolution. I think that's small potatoes. Um, I don't think a generation of citizens will be harmed if they don't quite understand the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation. I think what is, what is difficult is to contemplate an America, a generation of Americans growing up with a wedge driven between them and science. And the intelligent design movement proposes to drive exactly that wedge, which is aimed to produce what they call a theistic science. If that happens, then something that all of us in this room have taken for granted during our lifetimes is going to change. And that's something is that the United States is the worldwide leader in scientific research and technology. If we put that mantle down, and I think this movement has the potential to cause that to actually happen, a dozen nations around this world will eagerly pick it up, will take scientific leadership from us, and will never give it back. And that is what is at stake in Ohio and every one of the American states. Thank you very much for coming to
Professor Miller very much for his talk. Uh, he is open to questions. How much time, roughly? Oh, well, you've got as much as more than half an hour. Okay. Uh, fine. Uh, okay, we'll figure that's probably a reasonable time. Uh, uh, I'm going to moderate this, which means simply that I will point to people to stand up and ask questions. Uh, and uh, Patricia has suggested that I might contribute any comments that uh, I would find helpful, but I will try to be very restrained in doing that. Uh, so who has questions? Yes. Um, Dr. Miller, how do you explain these, quote, legitimate scientists supporting this? I am embarrassed to confess that Dr. Behe is a biophysicist. I am as well. And I was shocked to see that he was doing this. I've known him for many years. How did they get into this? And what's going on? And what's their agenda? Well, I, I'm not going to pretend for a minute to be able to psychoanalyze um, the people who stand on the other side of this debate. Um, but I will point out that almost to a person, they regard evolution as the foundation of a dangerous scientific materialism. And I'm going to point to somebody who I think really summed up the reason for the opposition best. And, and I think this reason applies even to a trained scientist like Michael Behe or Jonathan Wells, who has two PhDs, or Stephen Meyer, who's trained in philosophy. Um, this summer in August, I was listening to an interview on National Public Radio. And it was an interview with Senator Rick Santorum from Pennsylvania, who's just published a new book called It Takes a Family. And in there, it was like a 10-minute interview, and it was just to let him you know, promote his book and say what it was about. But in the middle of it, the interviewer asked him, you know, Senator Santorum, I found it strange that in the middle of your book, you took a shot at part of the science curriculum. Now, you're a senator, a politician, with no training in science. But nonetheless, you decided to take a shot at evolution. And then he said, why evolution? And it's almost an exact quote uh, that I almost have it memorized. And Senator Santorum says, because it really matters. It's where we come from. And he said, if we're just an accident, if we're a mistake of nature, then that puts a different moral demand on us. And he thought for a second and said, in fact, it doesn't put a moral demand on us. Then if we are the intentional creation of a supreme being who does make moral demands. Now think about that. Because what he said is that if evolution is right, morality is an illusion. And morality isn't just don't do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Morality is what's right in the world. How do you treat the poor? Issues of war and peace, economic justice, fairness, personal integrity. Morality matters, and I think it matters to all of us. It certainly matters to me. If you actually come to believe that evolution as a doctrine invalidates any sense of morality, you're going to oppose it whether you think it's scientifically justified or not. Now, I'm not going to pretend to look inside Dr. Behe's head and see if that's exactly what is making him tick. But I do know he has said very clearly that he thinks evolution and evolutionary materialism is a morally destructive doctrine. And I would assume that's the source of the motivation. Next question. Got one up on the balcony. OK, up there. Listen um, loud. You'll have to sure. talk loudly. Sure. Um, these folks uh, wouldn't participate through the political process instead of the scientific process, unless that's where the fertile ground was. I, I spent a lot of time on the political left and noticed that hostility towards science is just as great there. The new age stuff you were talking about, astrology, et cetera. You betcha, so yeah. What is it that we ought to be doing better? Well, I, I, that's a really good question. And I also, um, as, as an ex Barry Goldwater Republican, um, I appreciate you saying that large elements of the left are anti science. And it certainly is true. And you see this, for example, I think you see this most clearly in the European left, uh, where the European left has been enormously hostile to science and technology. I think, and, uh, and I'll accuse myself first, I think that we in science suck at getting our message across to the public. We are terrible popularizers. And as an example of that, I would ask how many people in the audience were aware of the discovery regarding the fusion of human chromosome number two? which was worked out about 18 months ago. I, yeah, exactly. A couple well-informed biologists. But aside, but aside from that, um, that should have been popularized. That should have been on the evening news, and there should have been sort of the Carl Sagan types 
writing about it and talking about it. And part of it is because, quite frankly, we in science, we have the best jobs in the world. I mean, how cool it is to be able to walk in your laboratory in the morning and say, gee, I wonder what I shall try to discover today. And, and you know what? That's the job that I have and a lot of other people in this room have, too, and that's cool. Um, so why would you want to get messed up in the political process if that was it? Um, so that's one reason is self-absorption. Another reason, I think, is a terrible and ultimately self-destructive tendency in the scientific community to look down our noses at popularizers. Example, Carl Sagan, who I think was the most effective popularizer of science in the last 30 or 40 years, in many circles was looked down upon by his colleagues in the astronomical and physical science community. Stephen Jay Gould, the great evolutionary biologist, this may come as news to some of you who don't, don't know this field very tightly, but Steve was actually looked down upon by many people who regarded themselves as more serious evolutionary scientists precisely because Steve wrote for the general public and did that brilliantly. Until we in the scientific community, A, do a better job of popularizing science, and B, begin to reward our best messengers to the public sphere, um, I think science is going to take heat from both the left and the right. And in front here? No. Okay, further back in the center there. Um, well, um, speaking from the left, I want to uh, just suggest a slightly different take on all of this. Sure. I think that when you said that what's at stake here is everything, you actually gave a very narrow definition of everything, because you only talked about science and technology. That, that's true. I, I agree. And, and I, I'll I think take what's that. at stake here, and many people on the left think that what's at stake here is literally everything. It's, it's, uh, it's not just uh, um, theocratic science, but it's theocracy in government. It's, um, it's many issues that are defined as moral issues by this or that you know, different uh, religious uh, group, and it's being pushed by the most... Um, restrictive religious perspective and not the, mo not the broadest religious perspective about what morality and what ethics is and what politics is and what democracy is and what the political structure should be. So I think it really is about everything in a much broader sense. And, and I'll just finish by saying that you asked about theocratic science. I've seen theocratic science. I had, when I was um, teaching at Rutgers, I had a student who was from Pakistan and she was providing me, she provided me a lot of articles about in English, about uh, Muslim science and how the goal of Muslim science should be to, um, they actually didn't talk so much about God, but they talked about principles of good and bad that, were, that could be discovered and, and dealt with, and they were talking about good and evil as the subject matter of science. No, I, I think that's a, that's a worthwhile point. Um, the, uh, um, it's interesting that you brought up Muslim science. Um, about three or four years ago, I started, because I have a lot of, I have a little uh, web page with a lot of evolution stuff up on it. I started to get emails from Turkey and Lebanon and even a couple from Iran, believe it or not, of students who wanted me to answer their questions about evolution. And I, a few of them I asked, why are you asking me this? And they connected me with the writings uh, that go under the pen name of Harun Yaha, who is an Islamic writer based in Turkey, who has written a whole series of anti-evolution books. And one of the students was actually kind enough to buy me an English translation of the book and mail it to me from Turkey so that I could see what all this was about. And it astonished me. Two parts about it were, one was, I suppose, not so astonishing, and one was downright hilarious. The uh, not so astonishing parts is that all of the arguments made in the Islamic world for the scientific insufficiencies of evolution are just recycled versions of the ones that I've talked to you about here, so there's nothing new. But the second part was genuinely amusing. And that is, her and Yaha argued to his young readers that they should appreciate the fact that evolution is a Western Christian plot to subvert the morals of Islamic youth. And as part, as part of his proof of this, he pointed out that Charles Darwin studied for the priesthood of the Church of England. And that proves to you that he's just another crusader, um, which I thought was a, a rather interesting, interesting take. But, but the other thing, you know, the other thing that's worth pointing out, and I think that we can learn a lot from the history of the Islamic world. And if you go back to the 13th or 14th century and you look at the great Muslim caliphate across the Near East and North Africa, that was the center of learning and science and cosmopolitan thought. The Islamic world was the leader in mathematics and astronomy and in many other branches of science.
Something happened to the Islamic world to the point where the amount of genuinely important science done in the Islamic world in the 20th century is, unfortunately, is very close to zero. And that something is exactly the ascendancy of the kind of theocratic talk that, you're, that, that you are talking about. And if this were to happen in the leading nation in the West, we could see the same sort of retreat backwards, and that worries me a great deal. Um, I just want to comment on, on this. Uh, a lot of folks on the left claim to be supportive of science, but as we saw with the uh, various uh, debates at the school board here in Ohio, our strongest support has come from traditional Republicans, traditional conservatives. The Democrats have been very, very weak in their support and sometimes have uh, also opposed the uh, science curriculum. Yeah, and I should, I should also point out, I mean, I showed a cartoon at the beginning to sort of point this out. Um, I wrote an op-ed piece right after the trial that was published in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And in the first part of it, I said, if there was ever a place where the proponents of intelligent design had a home field advantage, it was in the federal court in Harrisburg. They had a popularly elected school board that was behind them. They had a citizenry that was behind them. They had a federal judge recommended for the bench by Rick Santorum, who in his three years on the bench had established himself as a conservative jurist and a self-described strict constructionist. Everything should have gone their way. And in fact, the attorneys on our side of the case looked at this guy's record when we drew him and they said, boy, let's just hope he's smart. Well, as it turns out, um, he was. And he paid attention to the arguments um, and he wrote a very powerful decision that I would recommend to anyone. And it's particularly powerful because it came from a conservative jurist. And that's a valuable point to make. Uh, way in the back. <coughs> I want to add to that gentleman's point before. Um, you had mentioned about the Middle East. And my question is what happened? I mean, what happened here? Back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, science did everything. Everybody generally was seemed to be pretty interested. We put a man on the moon and atomic energy, everything else. Um, you know, was this always an underlying theme throughout the United States, or is it right now, or why is it right now in the last decade or two decades kind of rearing its ugly head now? Well, my, my short answer to that is that there has always been an active anti-evolution movement in the United States. Um, it has uh, ebbed and flowed in terms of the degree to which it has caught the public imagination. But if you look at opinion polls in which you ask people whether they accept the evolutionary theory of human origins, and you go back in these polls to the 40s and 50s, you find quite consistently, depending on how you phrase the question, that only about 35 to 45 percent of the people in this country accept evolution. That was true even back in those good old days of the 50s and 60s that you're talking about. Um, in the summer of 1964, I was a guide, to say more about my youth than you ever wanted to know, I was a guide at the Boy Scout Pavilion of the New York World's Fair. So I spent a whole summer at the World's Fair working a few hours a day in the Boy Scout Pavilion, my little shorts and neckerchief and everything else, and the rest of the time going around the fair, having just a wonderful time. There was an exhibit at that World's Fair, the New York World's Fair, uh, put up by the Moody Institute of Science. Because I was already a science geek at the time, I saw Institute of Science, cool, went in. It was an anti-evolution exhibit. Um, so this sort of organized anti-evolution activity has been with us for a long time. I think what is, when you say what's happening now, two things. I think one is that the political climate in the United States has made it much easier for people to take religious ideas into the mainstream and to run with them, to argue essentially that, you know, if science has an anti-religious bias, we have to correct it with a pro-religious bias. Um, and then the second thing is I think that the Edwards versus Aguilar decision in 1987 was a shockwave for the creationists. And you saw that dramatic change in terms of the adoption of this new idea. That the new label apply, and it's all it is, it's a label, applied to the creation science movement, intelligent design, brilliant PR. If you were working at an ad agency and you were brainstorming for a product name, man, when you came up for that, with that name, you should get a raise. Um, and I think in part, because it's a, a phrase that appeals to all people of faith. If you're a person of faith, I think by definition, 
you think that there is an intelligence, there's a, a guiding force to the universe, that, that your life has meaning and purpose and value. And then when you hear the word intelligent design, you figure, wow, that sounds like that's something that I should be on the side of. So I think it's a combination of constant anti-evolution sentiment and brilliant public relations on the part of the intelligent design movement. And I, I, let me just uh, add to that. I think that that's one thing that, that has really helped strengthen this movement is the ambiguity of the phrase intelligent design. That on one hand, it can mean we believe that there's a God who created the universe, and a lot of people believe that. And uh, the other meaning, however, is the idea that this concept of an intelligent creator ought to be made part of science, which is a very different thing. Next question. Do we have any over here? We have one. Uh, right on the aisles. Okay, fine. Uh, somebody over on this side, and then we'll get you next. Uh, about, okay, there. Um, you mentioned uh, you were sort of upset by the scientists not popularizing uh, or putting their their uh, views out there. There was an excellent show you may have seen, others may have seen on Charlie Rose, where James Watson and E.O. Wilson were uh, the people talking. Both of them had put out new editions of, of Darwin's books with their comments. Mm -hmm. And um, E.O. Wilson didn't have much to say about this, but James Watson unabashedly comes out with the idea that he absolutely doesn't see God fitting in anywhere. Okay, he's, he's an atheist or he's, you know, whatever, whatever his position is. And he said all his friends also, he could think of only one friend who, who could mix the two. And I'm, not, I'm not sure that James Watson really has a large circle of friends. <laughs> All right. P point taken, though. Okay. Well, maybe the the the, the one friend who did is uh, believe was is you know past is crick. But at any rate, the 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 question I have here though is is in the way this meeting started too with uh, with a prayer is somehow it's it's seen as not you know to be a scientist you're almost afraid in the United States maybe not in England to say that you're an atheist and and you seem to want to to uh, promote the idea that you're a Roman Catholic. I, I guess the question is, how, how do how those two things jive, and in, 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 how do they work with you and your, well, I, your I, mind? Well, I, yeah, sure. I, I don't intend to promote the idea that I'm a Roman Catholic. I mention it. Um, the, um, I, I am unaware of scientists in the United States who tell me that they are afraid to say that they are atheist or agnostic, um, because they say that all the time. Um, there's a, uh, there was a very interesting survey of the scientific profession and religious belief that was done by Ed Larson, and I forget who, else, who the other author Fair was. Um, but it was published, I believe, in, in Nature, or was it in Science? In Science or Nature, just a couple years ago. Um, and one of the things they discovered, it, well, there was a similar survey, surveying the scientific profession in, in the United States in 1917 or 1918. And what it showed is that in 1917 or 1918, about 40% of the scientific profession professed some sort of a belief in what could be construed to be a personal God. And that percentage was about the same today. So there is this consistency of belief in the scientific community. It's less than 50%. Um, I don't think that's necessarily surprising. Um, scientists are skeptical. Um, they, I tell my students that the first virtue of science is skepticism. So it's not surprising that scientists are skeptical about all sorts of things. Um, but I do think that um, most people within the scientific community have come to accept the notion that one can be a genuinely religious person in the traditional Abrahamic sense and still be fully accepting of science as a way to learn about the natural world. And if uh, James Watson would accept that, then I'd be very happy with him. He may see no place for God in his view of the world, I do. Um, that means we differ on matters of philosophy and theology, but I don't think it necessarily means we differ on matters of science. Over here. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I liked a lot of what you said. I thought it was good in terms of relating uh, this attack on evolution by the ID and that section of uh, the religious fundamentalist right. Um, what I guess I'd like you to speak to would be, and I'm also part of 
I write for the Revolution newspaper, and I also am part of World Can't Wait, Drive Out the Bush Regime. Uh, I think we are living in uh, the time of the rise of fascism in, in Germany. I think that, you know, uh, people like Robertson, Bennett's, the genocidal comments about black people by Bennett, uh, all these things that are clustered around the Bush regime, uh, I think, uh, and I think you speak to the dangers in terms of science. I just wondered how you saw this whole array and how science fits into it. And the battle in Dover and other places, including Ohio, Kansas, are critical to actually beating back the rise of fascism. Well, you, you've invited me to make a provocative political speech, and I hope you wouldn't mind too much if I declined the invitation. Um, I personally do not think that the times in the United States today are comparable to Germany in the 30s, if only because I think Americans are cognizant of what happened in Germany in the 30s and determined, absolutely determined not to let it happen. Um, and I would think that the court rulings that we've seen in Georgia and in Pennsylvania are a good example of the fact that we have an independent judiciary. Um, and we have people who are willing to stand up against this movement. I think, um, to be perfectly honest, I really don't want to, uh, to increase the politicization of science um, by arguing that science is uh, uh, against one political party or against one particular point of view. To me, the great virtue of science has always been that it is apolitical. And what I see that worries me right now in this country is the tendency to politicize science, to pretend that science and scientific rationalism is an idea that belongs on one side of the political spectrum. I think that's intellectually wrong, and I think it's enormously destructive to science. And my own determination, um, I know what I'll do when I go in the voting booth, but my own determination in, a, in the public sense is to fight for scientific rationalism, and that's what I think this battle is really all about. Uh, anybody over here so Patricia doesn't have to run around too much? Do you think there's a place for satire, or do you think it would be counterproductive? There was a website a little while ago um, in which um, a group... The Flying Spaghetti Monster? Exactly. <laughs> I think... Although it would, I mean, it would energize uh, a lot of us uh, in the States, probably, and elsewhere by the embarrassment that that would show up in, in what's happening. But maybe it would solidify the opposition. What do you think? I, 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 I'm not going to speculate on which tactic will work or solidify the opposition. The only thing I can tell you is that I'm a great fan of satire. I hope we never abandon humor as a tool to sort of lubricate our discussions of difficult issues. And I think um, one of the particular reasons why I have recommended Judge Jones's decision, in other words, go and read it, is because parts of it are really funny. Um, and I think that's a saving grace. Down in front here. But yeah, here and then. Yeah, he, he, the, 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 the physicist in the front row. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. He has been quiet. That's good. Yeah, it's very good. But, uh, uh, no, so we, as this debate has continued, I particularly become more sensitive, as you know, in writing things with you, in fact, to, 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 the, to the fact that science and religion can cope with these things. But at the same time, as it often has pointed out to me when I talk on this subject, it's really a little bit disingenuous to, to argue that there is no tension. And in fact... Oh, I, I wouldn't argue that for a second. Yeah. But, but, but I think scientists have to be more sensitive than we are. The fact that while a lot of this is, in fact, a lot of the reaction that you discussed is based on fear of science as the basis of the morality and everything. It's also based on a fear which is not completely displaced that science is, is in fact a threat to religious belief because it, it is, in fact, as, as, as a, a well-known atheist physicist, Steve Weinberg, has said, science does not make it impossible to believe in God, it just makes it possible to not believe in God. And it really is science in some sense that without science, everything's a miracle. And I think unless scientists are, are sensitized a little bit to the fact that science does present a, at some level to people a threat or perceived threat to their religious, religious beliefs, then we, if we overlook that, then we tend to be um, blasé and sometimes, in fact, counterproductive. An example, the best example I can think of is, is a debate John Calvert, who's the head of the ID Network, 
he always brings up this letter from 40 Nobel laureates about evolution, which says there is no evidence for design. And, of course, that's not true. I mean, there's no evidence for design and purpose to the universe, and that's just not a scientific statement. And if scientists make those kind of statements, it naturally sort of encourages the fear of science. And so I think we have to be particularly sensitive that science is threatened. I will just second your comment. I think they're very wisely chosen. Right here in front, right behind you there. And perhaps Dr. Prinshaus or Krauss could answer this about Ohio in particular. If Dover had its elections and changed the political spectrum there, what's the next step in Ohio? Do we know when the standards are being revised? I know that records have been requested in preparation perhaps for a lawsuit, but somebody could answer. I think that's you. Okay. The situation here is complicated. We don't have the easy out that Kansas and Dover and Darby, Montana had, because our Board of Education has 11 elected members and 8 appointed members appointed by the governor. If this had been a matter left to the elected members, we wouldn't have had the standards issue, the benchmark that invites critical analysis of evolution, which is clearly illegal based on the recent case law. And we wouldn't have had this lesson plan. So you can't blame our elected officials, sort of oddly enough. We could blame the governor for not paying more attention. Basically, the governor, as was revealed by the Hicks emails that were released this summer, the governor allowed certain creationist members of the board to sort of invoke his name for stuff without saying that it was not what he was promoting. And so they were able to manipulate other members of the board, and particularly the appointed members. So a lot of folks, unfortunately, went to the polls last fall and tried to vote out school board members, and they didn't really vote in, you know, vote out good ones and vote in bad ones, but nearly. It was, you know, it was not the approach to take. Instead, I think that one of the things that we can do right now is we have a window of opportunity, because the board is meeting next Tuesday in Columbus at Ohio School for the Deaf. You can find this on their website. Next Tuesday, the plan is for them to meet in closed session with some lawyers to talk about this. Now, I understand the Columbus dispatch is challenging that as illegal, that because it's not currently pending litigation. I'm not sure how that's going to go. But regardless of whether they talk about it in the morning or the afternoon, there will be an opportunity for public comment starting probably as early as 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Is that right? Yeah, around 1 o'clock. And any citizen, anybody actually, can come and comment. It's called open commentary on non-action items. Yes, non-action items. You come, you sign up, you fill out a card, and if there aren't a lot of people, you'll get five minutes. If there are a lot of people, you'll get two and a half or three, and you can say whatever you want. And it's very important to show up there and to state your opinion. And, again, folks that are sort of comfortable with science, with the academy, this sort of thing, they tend not to go down. But the board is often very, very welcoming of people. They want to hear from citizens. They especially like to hear from students, which I hadn't realized before I started going down there. But the issue, in a nutshell, is that we have a benchmark in the 10th grade curriculum that says students should describe how scientists continue to investigate and critically analyze aspects of evolutionary theory. And when that was sent up, I said, well, I don't have a problem with that. That's what scientists do. But I didn't realize fully the context at that point. It's very like the Georgia sticker, and it's illegal for the very same reason. And we see that it was built on to produce this lesson plan, which is full of the same stuff that's in the PANDAS book, and clearly, clearly illegal. In addition, and this hasn't, in fact, Ken got this a little bit wrong in his talk, we already have altered the definition of science here in Ohio. There were two things that the creationists got through in 2002. One was the critically analyzed benchmark, and the other was that they took the Ohio Academy of Science definition of science, and they cut off the part that refers to evidence and just kept the first part. Now, there are other places in the 
document in the standards where we say that science has to do with evidence. So I didn't get all that excited about that. But you see, it's a process where, you know, little bits chipping away. And actually, the Kansas folks used our definition to, to build on for that. So it's, it's already here. And that's another element of the standards that is clearly illegal right now. They can fix this next week, next Tuesday, if they hear that people are in favor of it. Does it matter? Hey, I'm going to answer this question. <laughs> okay. The answer to your question is yes. Um, I think both of those were true. I also think there's another element that, bo uh, and, and it, if you if you read the York Daily Record, which is the paper that covers Dover almost every day on the Internet, which I've been doing for the past four or five months, um, you can see this at work. I think the people of Dover were profoundly embarrassed by the actions of several members of the Board of Education. And I, I gave a hint of it when I said the judge said, they came in front of me and lied. Um, and there was one, there was one, at one point in this trial was just absolutely hilarious. Um, the purchase of these 60 copies, or thereabouts, of pandas and people, cost a certain amount, like $692, something like that. I don't know what it was. And um, they asked Alan Bonsell, who was a member of the board, where that money come from. It's in deposition. He said, I have no idea. It came from an anonymous donor. Okay. So you do the discovery process. You subpoena everybody. Put them on the stand in the trial. Um, said, where did the money come from? He says, I have absolutely no idea. I heard it came from an anonymous donor. What is this, Mr. Bonsell? Canceled check. How much is it made out to? $692. Whose name is that? Uh, it's my name. Um, so would you like to reconsider what you just said? <laughs> and, so forth? and he said, well, what I meant was I went to my church. I told the congregation we needed money for this. I passed the hat. I collected the money. I put it into my bank account. I wrote the Board of Education a check. But I didn't notice who put in a 5 and who put in a 10 and who put in a 20. So when I said I had no idea where the money came from, that's what I meant. And at that point, the judge cut up the other lawyer and said, excuse me, don't insult the intelligence of this court by pretending that an answer that you have no idea is equivalent to saying you solicited it, you collected it, you bundled it, and transmitted it. Um, and um, there was another case where a member of the board who was one of the instigators named William Buckingham uh, on, on the deposition at the trial said that he never said he never wanted to teach creationism. He never mentioned creation science. This is a figment in the imagination of the plaintiffs. He just wanted to teach intelligent design. Then they play a videotape from the local news TV station that had preserved the tape. Reporter shoves a microphone in his face and he said, I think as long as we're teaching evolution, we have to balance it by teaching creation science. Um, this sort of disingenuous testimony um, I think in profoundly embarrassed people in Dover. Um, I don't know if there'd be anything like that, the equivalent of that in Kansas or Ohio. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Dover elections were pretty close. Uh, the electorate voted for the new board like 53% to 47%. So it was, even though they won every seat, it wasn't a complete landslide. Um, has science won the hearts and minds of the people of Dover, Pennsylvania? I don't think so. I think it won the hearts and minds of a fair number of them, and a lot of them just got fed up and disgusted with what they regarded as the antics of the Board of Education. So that's my analysis from outside of what happened in Dover. In the front here. Uh, it, it's already on. They'll switch to it. Congratulations to Talk right into the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations to yourself, uh, the Thanks. plaintiffs the lawyers and the entire team that put together the, uh, the case. Uh, were there any difficult moments um, during your cross-examination? Was there something that you did not expect? Any line of questioning? Yeah, there, there was something that I did not expect, but it wasn't a difficult moment. And that is that during, my, uh, during the trial, 
I talked about the blood clotting, showed some of the slides I showed you. I talked about the flagellum, showed some of the slides I showed you, and I talked about human chromosome number two. During my cross-examination, I wasn't asked about any of it. In other words, you know, I expected them to fight on the science. Not a single challenge on the scientific issue. And that, because I was really prepared for that. And that came as a surprise. And instead, um, they uh, combed old editions of my textbooks to look for phrases that they could get me to say were equivalent to intelligent design, where they look for the website that I maintain for my university course, where I have some links if people want to see what the intelligent design controversy is about. They can go to this link. Isn't that the same thing, Dr. Miller, as the statement that the Dover Board of Education penned? And I didn't think so, and I explained why. But that, it was actually a pretty easy cross-examination from my point of view. Um, I, w I was very heartened by the uh, Dover decision by Judge Jones. It was uh, sort of one of those positive moments of the year. Um, but I have to think that the creationist movement is going to come up with something else, that there's going to be... They already have. You know, or a sudden emergence theory. Is that, or, or is there going to be something... What, what do you think is the next assault going to be from creationists? Because I think intelligent design is dead. Yeah, so well, what's next? Okay. You've got it right here. And that is the next thing is... We don't want to teach intelligent design. We want to teach critical analysis of evolution. That is the next thing. And that is what is being pushed in a whole variety of states. In Kansas, for example, they may have changed the definition of science, but the Kansas Board of Ad is adamant saying, home the standards. We don't mention intelligent design. All we do is critically analyze evolution. So I think critical analysis of evolution is the next step, and you've got it right here. Uh, if I may add one thing, we've been talking about the science, and that's quite appropriate, but I would maintain that until the theological presuppositions that underlie the attacks on evolution are addressed, and they need to be addressed by churches, by clergy, that, that the, this anti-evolution movement simply is not going to go away, and there will keep on being new uh, avatars of intelligent design, creationism, or whatever it's called. Yeah, I mean, critical analysis is, is nearly as brilliant a, a moniker as intelligent design because they say, well, you know, how come the scientists are against critical analysis, right? How could that be? And, of course, if you look at the content of the lesson plan, it's not critical and it's not analysis. It's an attempt to convince students to uncritically swallow wholesale outright lies about the content of science. And you don't have to take my word for it, uh, and indeed the board didn't two years ago. But we now have the records, and their own science experts at the Department of Education, Ohio, told them, we have the sheets where they said it, they said, the underlying sentence is a lie. This is wrong. This is inaccurate. This is crackpot. This is religion. This is creationism. Uh, it's all in there. It's very, very similar to the Dover case, although they weren't quite as dramatic in their public statements. That's the only difference. There's another in front here. Question. You talked about the dichotomy between, uh, or the false dichotomy between religious belief and science. And presumably the fear of evolution is based on the belief that if you believe in evolution, then the Bible must be wrong. That, that, that's, that's one aspect. But there are, others, there are other concerns as well. Okay. So is, as you alluded to, perhaps part of the uh, social and uh, public issue here, a better understanding of the Bible and what it means, after all, there are two stories of, of creation in the book of Genesis, which is up front, which is why, which is perhaps as far as people get in reading the Bible. <laughs> you think that modern reading, modern study and scholarly interpretation of how the Bible evolved and how religious belief evolved is the other side of this equation? Um, I, I, I'm tempted to defer to Reverend Murphy on this, but, but I, I certainly would agree Although I would look back at, at, at the history of perhaps the past 500 years of Christendom, and I would suggest that perhaps expecting Christians to come to consensus uh, about the meaning of the Bible is a hopeless quest. Well, I, but, but I would agree. That, that is a, and that's really one of the things that I was referring to earlier, that the, uh, basically more theological literacy, critical reading of Scripture is a very important component of what I was talking about. I think we probably have time for about two more questions. One back here. Uh, I was, uh, it's a technical question. I mean, uh, do biologists, when considering uh, evolution, consider the time for these complex uh, smaller systems to combine together. Do you consider the time interval like uh, 
Does it happen fast in certain cases or does it happen slow in certain organizations? Um, I, I didn't quite understand everything you said. You're talking about viruses? You're talking about no, the time complex, required. You, you were talking about complex oh. systems. Oh, okay. Like, so, uh, I mean, I was just curious, like, um, so if yeah, there sure. is an intelligent designer, did he take time for some cases to combine and bring, yeah. uh, come up with a complex system or? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I can answer this very directly in a couple of ways. Um, the, uh, uh, we don't know how long it took for the blood clotting system or the bacterial flagellum to evolve, but we can look, for example, at how long it has taken entirely new genes to evolve. And one of my examples that I, that I always love, I didn't show the slide tonight, I can show it to you afterwards if you like, um, is that in the 1970s, a group of Japanese scientists were hanging around uh, a chemical factory, and there was a big waste dump of plastic waste, and they noticed there was growing on the surface of it what looked like a lawn of bacteria. But this made no sense to them, because what was being dumped in here was nylon polymer waste, and that's synthetic and bacteria can't grow on it. Nonetheless, there they were. And they, isolate, they took the bacteria, they cultured them in the laboratory, and they discovered that these were pseudomonas bacteria that had evolved an entirely new enzyme called nylon ACE. And the, it breaks down nylon. And this enzyme actually evolved from junk DNA, from repetitive DNA, into which there had been a little flipping around of the genetic code, so a promoter popped up, transcribed it, and then evolved an enzyme with more and more activity. How long did it take for this entirely new protein to evolve? And, and obviously, very great selective advantage, because now the bacteria can grow where they couldn't before. Less than 65 years. And the reason we can say that with some degree of certainty is that it was only 65 years ago that nylon was synthesized for the first time. So that's one example. My other favorite example is a seven-step pathway with seven different enzymes that breaks down 2,4-dinitrotoluene. This is one of the components of TNT. It's an explosive. Um, this, too, was first synthesized in the 1930s. And two years ago, an Air Force laboratory in Florida was able to show that the bac there were soil bacteria in the grounds of Air Force bases that, that had soil contaminated with this explosive residue that had evolved a seven-step pathway by co-opting enzymes from other biochemical pathways that serve different purposes to break this down. And this clearly had also happened since the 1930s. So where you have the proper opportunity, evolution can work very quickly and can produce some remarkable changes. One final question. I'm, the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry? Two? curious, and maybe Patricia's the one who can answer this. It was a group of parents in Dover who brought the legal suit against the uh, school board. Is there a similar action here in Ohio? You're saying what Ohio has done is illegal. Are parents or citizens out there challenging it legally? I'll let Patricia answer in detail, but I'll answer it quickly from my amateurish understanding of the law. To file a lawsuit, you have to have standing which is to say if you sue a government agency saying its actions are unconstitutional, you have to first show that you were injured by that government action. So all of the 11 plaintiffs in Dover were parents with kids in the classroom either t having that statement read to them or about to have it read to them. That was their standing. An ordinary citizen in Dover with nobody in the public schools could not have gone to federal court and filed that lawsuit. So you need some degree of standing. My guess would be that parents in Ohio whose students were being made to use that lesson plan or be testing on it would have similar standing if they wished to file a lawsuit. Um, not all of the parents in Dover had uh, kids that were in high school. Some of them had That's little right. kids, so you only have to intend to send your kids to the That's school. That's right. But the issues of standing and things like that, if someone's interested in being involved in an action like this, um, I can put them in touch with the folks that are organizing. So you can always uh, email me at evolution at case.edu, and I can put you in touch with uh, the folks that are doing it. I don't know all these issues of standing, but I know folks who do. A final comment here, I believe. Let me take advantage of your experience with Kitzmiller in Dover and draw a couple of parallels with Ohio. Uh, the tactics in Dover were initially Buckingham and Bonzel arguing for some sort of 50-50 creationism evolution, and then that transformed into finally what uh, yielded a uh, the one-minute disclaimer read by administrators school children. In Ohio, 
The initiation was a 2000 motion before the State Board of Education for a two-model approach, a motion made by Professor Deborah Owens Fink of the University of Akron, a member of the board. It failed 9-5. That then morphed, and in the course of your discussion with Myers and Wells, the compromise devised by Bruce Chapman, president of the Discovery Institute, and Meyer, the associate director of the, what is it, the Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture. Yeah, they decided the word renewal was embarrassing. It's now the Center for Science and Culture. Yes, I know. I haven't changed yet. Good for you. And that ultimately resulted in the standard calling for critical analysis, and then, as Mr. Latimer has been kind enough to tell us, at a 2003 Intelligent Design Conference, the packing of the writing committee and the consequent lesson plan that is derived from Wells' icons of evolution, be he's Darwin's black box, pandas and people, and in fact, our library has traced it back to the 1960s creationist literature. Given that fact situation, what would be your view of the likelihood of finding another Judge Jones in the federal courts in Ohio? I know very well when I'm asked a question that is beyond my expertise. <laughs> and that is exactly such a question. But I will tell you, um, since I've made exactly two appearances in federal court with judges who were drawn for cases by lot, that at the district level, I have to tell you that I'm impressed with the intelligence and the integrity and the dedication to the constitutional mission of the federal judiciary. And I would hope very much that uh, that impression would be reinforced if any case on this issue ever got into the federal courts in Ohio. And I pray that that would be true. Thanks. Thank you. Change. Yes, go right, go right ahead. Um, and it's keynote and you